Hello everybody and welcome to an introduction to Lighttable. Lighttable is an interactive development environment created by Chris Granger and it currently supports three main programming languages Clojure and Clojure Script, JavaScript and Python although the plan is to add more languages as time goes on. To get hold of Lighttable you just need to point your web browser to lighttable.com and you'll land on this page and then you can choose the build that's appropriate for the operating system that you're running. During this introductory screencast I'm going to try and cover these areas. To start with I'm going to try and explain why I'm excited by Lighttable. Then I'm going to talk about getting started in Lighttable uh, in an Insta REPL and, and I should say that this screencast is very much focused on using Lighttable as a closure or closure script developer because that's what I am. So I can't say so much useful about JavaScript or Python, although some of the things that I talk about will be valid for that use too. Okay, so getting started with Clojure, creating a, a Clojure project, and then a little bit about customization, how you can customize uh, key maps and even user behaviors in Lighttable. Okay, so let's start by trying to sell you on the idea of Lighttable. Why is Lighttable something that you should be looking into? Well, there are a number of reasons, uh, a couple of concrete ones that are true now and then a couple that are more gut feeling uh, hope that I have for the future for Lighttable. So let's start with the concrete ones. So I think the first and main one is the fact that Lighttable has excellent inline feedback. You'll see it later when I start demoing how Lighttable works, uh, but you get inline feedback in terms of evaluating your code and getting instant feedback. You have inline feedback in terms of seeing documentation for the functions that you're using. Uh, and for me, this inline feedback is a huge win uh, compared to other development environments because it helps me keep in my flow. If you're anything like me, when you're programming, you tend to get into this focused zone where you're in a flow and you don't want to be disturbed and you're, you're understanding the problem that you're trying to solve. And with this inline feedback, you don't need to switch context, let's say, you want to know how a function works instead of going to a web browser and having the possibility of, oh, there's a new um, feed come up in my RSS reader or uh, what check in Facebook or whatever it is that you do in a web browser, that, that risk is gone because you're just getting that feedback directly in the IDE. And the same thing with evaluating the code. There are a lot of um, closure development environments where they have a REPL built in, but to me there's a big difference between having the separate context of an editor and a REPL where you have to remember which context you're in and copying from one to the other to just always being in th this inline mode that Lighttable has that lets you forget about that and just concentrating on the coding and understanding the software that you're writing. So for me that's a big one. Then another big one that is even there right now is customizability. Can I spell it correctly? I think that's right. Uh, the whole concept behind Lighttable is to enable you to create a very customized experience around your IDE. Uh, the, I will talk a little bit about the architecture later, but the whole architecture is set up to allow customizability and uh, it, it's customizable in a way that few other pieces of software are. And I believe that this customizability is going to get even stronger with the next main release when uh, Chris releases plugins, which is going to take this to an even higher level. Uh, and I think customizability is important for IDEs because Everyone has slightly different ways of thinking, slightly different approaches to writing code, and uh, being able to set it up exactly how you like it, I think, is very important. Okay, so those are the two main concrete reasons why I'm excited by Lighttable and, and why I use it as my main uh, closure development environment. But there are a couple more uh, sort of fluffier or gut feeling reasons why, why I think Lighttable is going to really make a difference in the future. So I can talk a little bit about those now. And the first one is the architecture. Uh, now, I'm talking a little bit based on things that Chris has written in, in the Google group or from his blog. I haven't seen the source code for Lighttable. I haven't seen any high-level architecture diagrams. Um, so some of the things that I understand may not be 100% correct. Um, but from what I've understood about the architecture, Chris describes it as um, a bot architecture, B-O-T which stands for behavior object tag. So this behavior object tag architecture that he's built is uh, 
he uh, he likens it to a CES architecture or a component entity system. And uh, I, I'm aware of that. And anyone that's done any kind of games program or development should probably be aware of that because it's very popular in that um, market. And basically the idea is with the component entity system is that instead of building up your the components of your game via some complicated traditional object-oriented um, hierarchy, uh, inheritance hierarchy, which tends to get very bogged down and very uh, you tend to sort of cement yourself into a particular solution and it's hard to add, add uh, new functionality doing that. Uh, what they recommend instead is composability and composability is something that I think has been pretty big in the OO world for quite some time now, the idea that you should be composing objects of other objects instead of inheriting. So that's a pretty, it's, it's pretty well proven that that's the right way to go with OO. So what's this behavior object tag? Well, it's, it's basically taking that idea and applying it to uh, the IDE. So taking what you learn from, this is a great way to build games, and applying it over to the things that are specific to an IDE. So for example, within an IDE, you have different objects or different parts of the interface, and those have different behaviors. And you can share behaviors between objects. And with the tag system, you're just increasing the, the editability, if you like, by allowing you to tag different behaviors and uh, apply them to the objects that you want. And like I said, I don't have a complete understanding of exactly how this architecture works, but from what I've read, it strikes me as a very good approach. And uh, I've seen how quickly Chris is able to uh, de develop new functionality using this architecture that he's built. Um, so, uh, and, and I think that's only going to continue into the future, and especially when he's built in this uh, plugin architecture that's coming soon. So again, this is a gut feeling thing, but my gut feeling is that this is a good architecture for IDEs and something that I think other people uh, might want to pick up on in the future. And then there's another one, and this one might be a little bit contentious, but I, I, I agree with Chris in his uh, theory that how we currently program kind of sucks. And this is kind of a strange thing to say. What do you mean how we program sucks? It's... um. Chris says it like this, he says that there are three things he thinks that are wrong with uh, programming, that it's unobservable, that it's indirect, and that it's incidentally complex. I think that's how you spell it. And what does he mean by that? And, and, and I just want to say that I agree with Chris on it. I agree that these three problems exist with programming. So what do we mean by uneserv unobservable? What we mean is that we build these complicated systems um, that if you're building them the right way, according to me, are very data focused. There's a lot of data that's being manipulated, um, but we don't have a good way of seeing the state of that data all the time. Um, it's very common that we, people that want to view a system will do something like put logging in, uh, which of course doesn't give you much of a view. It's only very, very specific. Or, or you can, of course, use a debugger, but that's a very sliced view, just what's happening right now on this line of code. And you, it's difficult to sort of get an overview of what's happening in the system and how one part of the system affects another part. So there's definitely this problem with unobservability. Somehow it feels like we're looking at the system through a little keyhole as opposed to sort of opening the door and getting a really good look at it. So that's a problem. Then uh, there's another problem with how we currently program, and it's that it's indirect. Brett Victor has... Um, a very interesting definition for programming. He, he calls programming uh, blindly manipulating symbols, which sounds quite derogatory, but when you think about it, that's exactly what we're doing. We, we edit text files with symbols in them that then get interpreted or compiled in, into a piece of software that's executed on the, the CPU. And there's such a chasm between the text file and what actually gets implemented or executed, I should say, um, that there's no other way to describe it but indirect. It's, it's like pulling a lever in one room and then running off to another room to look through a window to, to see what happens. It's not that lovely direct feedback that we're used to in terms of, imagine interacting with paint uh, or Photoshop or Word or anything where when you do something you get direct feedback. Programming isn't really like that. And of course we try different techniques to improve the directness of the programming, but uh, we haven't come that far with solving that problem yet, in my opinion. And then the third problem is incidental complexity. So what is incidental complexity? It's complexity that's not inherent 
in the problem that you're trying to solve. So let's say you're trying to build a financial system for a stock exchange, that there's inherent complexity in that problem around transferring money and accounts and uh, performance and all these different issues that are inherent in the problem. But incidental complexity is the complexity we build up around the problem to try and solve it that is not directly related. Uh, so let me just try and give you an example. If you're doing classic OO programming, then you maybe have a database that's a, a standard SQL database, and to then map that to your objects, you have an ORM system, and not the database and SQL and all, none of that is to do with the problem space. It's just complexity that you're adding as a way to try and solve the problem. And of course, it's impossible to get down to zero incidental complexity. Um, but uh, sinking the incidental complexity as much as we can is definitely what we should be shooting for. So what, does, what do any of these three have to do with Lighttable? Well, the way I see it is this. Chris understands that these three things are a problem. And without that understanding, that you have no hope of being able to solve them. And I'm not saying that Chris is going to solve these three anytime soon, or if Lighttable necessarily is going to be the things that solves this for us. But in my... Um, in my experience, I haven't come across somebody else that's talking about these problems, not around IDEs anyway. Um, so just the fact that Chris understands it and he's trying to make um, inroads into solving these problems gives me a lot of hope for the future of Lighttable. Okay, and then one more thing that I think uh, is interesting about Lighttable, or one of the things that I like about it, and this again could be a little bit contentious, is the fact that it's written in Clojure. Or actually, it's a written in Clojure script, but uh, the point is the same whether it's Clojure or Clojure script. So, what? Why do I think that that's important or useful? Uh, and isn't that just language snobbery? Oh, you're a Clojure developer and you like Clojure. Yeah, I, I do like Clojure, but the the reason why I like it is because I think it's the language that I've come across at least that goes the most. Uh, to, to helping us in these three problems, unobservability, indirectness, and incidental complexity. Uh, so let's start with incidental complexity. So because you don't have these big, complicated, patterned, um, object-oriented structures in Clojure, you just have these much more simple building blocks or with functions. Um, it, it, it just helps reduce that complexity. I could go on and on. I'm not going to... I'm trying to be talking about light table and not closure so I shouldn't go on too much so let me let me just pick I could pick maybe a dozen things that, that helps in reduce incidental complexity with closure but let me just pick two so it's a bit faster so one of them is value oriented programming there's a, there's a huge difference in terms of complexity uh, between having place oriented program where you're updating in place where you have just a, an address that you're rewriting the uh, value 42, value 43, you, you know, where you're losing the history compared to Clojure's approach to uh, dealing with uh, state over time, which is values. And uh, you'll see later how Chris has managed to make the whole IDE basically one big value, uh, which is uh, a very interesting approach and gives a lot of power, but also helps to reduce the complexity. Um, so that's a fantastic combination. And what about indirectness? I guess both in both indirectness and unobservability are improved by any uh, programming languages that enables you to develop in a REPL because they do give you slightly, you are getting a, a better access to the system than you would in a traditional one where you're uh, compiling or do and, and deploying it to an application server and then testing against that. That's such a slow feedback loop that your observability and um, direct control over it definitely goes down. Um, and I still think closure isn't the final answer to solving any of these problems, but it's the one that gives you the least headache of the, these three that I've come across. Uh, so that's why I think the fact that it's developed in closure script uh, is definitely a big bonus for Lighttable. Okay, so that's enough selling you guys on why I'm excited about Lighttable and why I think it's the future. Let's hop into getting started in Lighttable. So this is the page that you see when you first fire up Lighttable, it's a, a welcome page. And uh, one thing I should say straight away is that a lot of uh, changes get done fairly quickly in Lighttable. Chris is adding new functionality and new uh, behavior at a rapid pace. 
Um, so some of the things that I'm running, as you can see, version 0.5.17. Um, so if you uh, watch this video in the future, and he's now on version 7 or 8 or whatever it is, there's a high chance that a lot of what I have in here will not be true anymore. Um, but hopefully some of the core concepts will, will still be true to make it still worth watching. But that's just a heads up for you guys. So that's the version that I, that's currently being run. Um, and as I said, I'm going to be talking about Lighttable very much from a closure perspective. Um, there's some other good good documentation out there if you're a Python developer it, um, that exists in the uh, traditional documentation. In fact, let, let's start by showing you guys the main way that you're going to be interacting with uh, Lighttable in terms of uh, issuing commands. And that's by pushing control space, which opens up the command pane here on the right hand side. So if I delete that, so if you have a blank search field, you can see all of the commands that are uh, valid for me to run right now. Things about changing the window, zooming in, Vim commands, about controlling tabs, settings, par edit commands, evaluation, editor, etc. So you can sort of um, navigate your way around the functionality just by looking through this window. And uh, it has a fuzzy search functionality. So let's say we wanted to open a closure insta REPL, we could just start typing REPL, and then we see all of the uh, all of the commands that match fuzzy match REPL, including toggle live mode and open a closure insta REPL. So we will choose that. So here we have a live closure insta REPL. And if you're beginning to uh, program closure in Lighttable, this is a pretty good place to start if you're if you're new to Clojure or you're new to Lighttable, you can just hop into the Insta REPL and start typing. And you see if you have the live mode enabled in the right here, uh, the results just start appearing straight away. And that's kind of neat, but I actually quite like to develop with the live mode off. And how that works is when you've changed the code, then you actually have to push command enter to evaluate the current form, uh, the brackets that you're inside of basically. So you can do some neat things in here. So let's say we wanted to write a function that uh, calculates factorial. So we might start with saying, okay, we have a range from one to a number, let's say five, and you can just evaluate that and you see the results straight away in line, one, two, three, four. And it, I don't know if you guys know, but factorial is, uh, so factorial of four would be four times three times two times one. So, what, so we've got the range here for factorial 4. So if we actually wanted to multiply them together, we can just do a reduce multiply, delete that bracket, and run this, and that's the factorial of 4. But one thing you'll notice, mm, that's a bit strange because the range doesn't mention 4, it mentions 1 to 5, and that's because of the way range works. It is uh, start inclusive and end exclusive. But how can we find that out? Not only can you do inline results in Lighttable, you can now also do inline documentation, which I have added a key map for command D. I'll show you how to do that later. But you see here it explains that you have a variable arity function where you can pass in nothing, pass in an end or both a start and an end as we've done in this case. And as you see, it says it's inclusive from the start and exclusive on the end. So for a function, what that means is to make it a bit clearer what's going on, we might want to say inc4 and rerun. It's the same result, but what we're now saying is that this is the number that we're um, doing a factorial for. And let me just quickly, let's just finish this off then. Let's define a function called factorial, factorial. It takes a number. Let's turn off the inline documentation. It takes a number, and now instead of doing four, we can do it for any number, and we'll close the last bracket. And we can execute. Now we have a function, and then when we call factorial, we can call factorial four, and hopefully we get the same result, and we do. So that's nice. So that's using both inline evaluation and inline documentation. Uh, to uh, work your way forward to a solution. Very nice. 
Okay, what about if you don't know these functions, if you don't know they exist? Of course, one thing you could do is go off uh, to a web browser and look at the closure cheat sheet and try and figure out uh, what options are there available. But uh, Lighttable also has built-in documentation search for both Clojure and Clojure script. So if we open up the command pane again and we search for documentation, toggle documentation at cursor, open Lighttable's documentation. Okay, well, let, before I do documentation search, let me uh, just show you this one. This is a great place to uh, look when you're getting started is the built-in documentation. It talks about how you get started with Clojure, JavaScript, Python. It's talking about uh, how the workspace works. I can show you that in a second. About navigating between files if you have multiple files. Uh, so there's a lot of good stuff in there, so I can definitely recommend looking at that. Uh, but is it just doc? Yeah, here we go. So it's not called documentation, it's called docs, search language docs. So here we can just do a search and you see we're currently searching for Clojure, but you can also switch over to Clojure script. So let's say we didn't know, we, we thought we wanted to do something with reduce and we type reduce and then you can see the documentation for reduce or reduced or reductions. Again, this does fuzzy matching and tries to find things that are related. So it's actually a really nice way of um, learning your way forward through uh, if you're new to Clojure. So that's great. So now I've talked about inline documentation and documentation searching. So, what we're, but I guess after a while, once you've started to get used to Clojure and you've started to get used to Lighttable, you're probably not going to want to spend all your time in the Insta REPL. You're probably going to want to start a project. And the, the way, uh, let me close. The command pane, the way uh, Lighttable handles projects is it has something it calls the workspace, which I have added a keyboard shortcut for, but you can also get to by using the view workspace uh, menu command. So projects, are, you're not able to create new projects right now from within Lighttable. If you're doing closure projects, you create them externally, and the most common way is using Liningen. And if you've never done that before, um, feel free to watch my video about getting started with test driving closure in Lighttable. I'll link to it in the comments of, in the description of this video. So that shows you how to do that. And once you've done that, then you can import the folder for the, the project you've created, and then you, you bring in the lining and uh, project structure. So that's how it works. And I think this will be a good candidate potentially in the future to be uh, a plugin for Lighttable. That you, somebody writes a lining and plugin that gives you a lot of lining and functionality directly within Lighttable. So you don't need to even go off to a command line uh, to create projects and do other lining and functionality. Uh, but I understand why that's not core functionality in Lighttable. And I think that's correct that it shouldn't be core. And it's, you, it's not like you create new projects every couple of hours, so it's not much of a hassle to go externally now and do that. Okay, so that's projects. What was the next thing I wanted to do after create? Customization, that's right. As I said, in, in uh, one of the things that I think are a big advantage for Lighttable is its customizability. And let's start with talking about key maps. So you've seen me use a couple of custom key maps here. But before I show you the custom key maps, let me show you what the default key maps look like. Let me just turn off the... And also it's worth noting that I have zoomed in the font size. So when you're using Lighttable, you won't have these comically large uh, fonts. It will be much smaller. Uh, it's just to make it easier to, for you guys to see the text on the video. But looking at the default key map is a great way to learn uh, what functionality is available in Lighttable. You'll see that it's a closure date structure, it's a map, and it has a plus. And, and what this means is that it's a plus delta, and you're adding these to uh, some kind of a base key map, I guess. And you can add it based in an app context, which is globally for the entire app, or in an editor context, which is when you have opened up an editor window to edit a file. Um, things that are specific for tabs or pop-ups. So this is the context for uh, each of the key maps. And then each context, again, has another map, a nested map, and it has a key of the, the actual keys that you want to map and the value, which is the 
light table command to run. So these are the default ones, but let me show you how you create custom ones. So if we go to the user key map, so these are all of the ones that I have set up. So for example, you saw the um, P meta shift W, which is to open and close the workspace. And P meta, by the way, is the one that maps to command. I'm running on a Mac, so that maps to the command key. So command shift W to show the workspace, command shift C to toggle the console. I also use command shift N to create a new file and directly set the syntax to closure. And those are all in the app app level context. And then I have a few in the editor level. So when I'm just editing individual files, toggle comment selection, command colon, um, comment, toggle the documentation, the inline documentation that you saw, command D, et cetera, et cetera. And this is another interesting, whoops, let me go back to the key map, user key map. This is another interesting feature that's been recently added. It's, I would call it partial par edit support. Um, you shouldn't look at the letters that I've chosen here because I'm one of those uh, strange and annoying people that uh, don't use a QWERTY keyboard layout. I actually use Dvorak. So my colleagues at work always hate pair programming with me because they always have to remember to switch the uh, the keyboard input when they take the keyboard over. But uh, but anyway, let me show you just quickly how that, that par edit works. So. One thing you can do is say, select the parent. Oh, let me turn that off. It was control. So control D and I've selected the parent, which the parent form of where the cursor was. And if I do it again, you see I've selected that one. And that means that I can then run time unable to, yeah, because N is, that's okay. N is uh, not, not been specified at this, or we can select the parent again. And it's a nice way to navigate between. And if I push left and I go to the beginning, and if I do that again, control D, 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 and push right, I go to the end of that selection. So it's a nice way to navigate. But you can also do things like move where the, the brackets are structurally. So if I say that I want to grow this bracket to the left, or shrink it and bring it back where it was, or I can shrink the right bracket or grow the right bracket. So I have those set on my home keys using control. And it's a, it's a nice way to structurally change the shape of the, the code because it understands that it's built with forms. And it should be said that this isn't a full uh, par edit solution yet, but it's a good step in the right direction. So those are definitely worth um, setting up for yourself if you're a Clojure developer. Then I've set some things up about doing watches. Uh, I'm not going to demonstrate watches now, but there's some good videos out there that Chris has done to demonstrate how watches work. And then for zooming in and out, I can just show you quickly how that is. So we can just make the text bigger or smaller or reset it back to normal. Okay, so that's customizing the key maps. And before I leave this, I should actually show you how this works. So what you can do is if we just delete that one, so if we wanted to have control shift C as toggle console, what we do is we type a colon and then you'll see that we've automatically got up a list of possible options. And again, you have fuzzy searching, fuzzy matching here. So if we start typing console, then you see all of the uh, commands that we can apply that involve console have come up, including toggle console. So that's how you can figure out what options you have and uh, you don't need to remember each command off by heart. Okay, and when you save the key map, then it automatically loads directly. Mm, and maybe I should say about this. Um, no, let's let's hop on to the, the behaviors because maybe that's a better way to explain that. So if we type behaviors, let me show the default behaviors. Now this, this is a clear way of showing what Chris calls the IDE as a value. What this is saying is we've got a map where we're, again, it's this plus delta or minus delta. It's so that you can have multiple files that are applying on the same core values and you can either add or take away behavior. It's just a flexibility thing. But he's saying the app has a set of behaviors and these are the default behaviors for the application. Loading the keys, stopping watches. And, and you'll see it's all just a data structure describing the behavior. It is literally just a value. 
and then you've got uh, this similar set of behavior around the, the browser, around the client, client dev tools. Um, this is a big file, and here are all the different types of file types that are supported, and what editor you should use for those file types, etc. And this shows you basically how how the program is constructed around this concept of it's just one big value describing the behavior. Again, back to this behavior object tag architecture that Chris has developed. And the cool thing is that if we go to the user behaviors file, you can edit that, but you don't need to edit directly here because we're applying a delta to that file. So we can add or overwrite existing behavior in that file in our own user behaviors uh, in our own user behaviors file without having to, if let's say we edited directly here and made a mistake, if we've saved it, we could have lost the old version of the file. We might have broken light table, but if you edit it in here, all you need to do is delete your edits and you'll be back to the default. So how does this work? Well, just like the key maps, you have different contexts for adding or removing behavior. So for example, I've added uh, editor behavior for my uh, custom theme that I developed called journal which I'll put a link for in, in the description for the video if you want to download that and try it yourself so you just tell Lighttable to set the theme to journal and we can change this so if I say default and you see it gives you hints even of the different uh, values that you can choose and as soon as I hit save we're back to the default where I can choose something like solarized light save it and now we have a light theme and uh, light table has uh, two concepts around themes and, and that's that you have the theme which is how the text looks you could basically say and then the skin which is how the app looks so if we change that to light and hit save you'll see that we get slightly different looking tabs and hover key colors etc so let's change these back to dark and change this back to my theme channel save okay um, but what other kind of behaviors can you add or take away here let's try adding a behavior around uh, line numbers so this works just like it does with the key maps where you type a colon first and then it gives you some hints so if we start typing line then we get a number of suggestions around line and we can do both hide line numbers or shown line numbers so we'll choose that one which auto populates the closure keyword uh, that Lighttable uses for this behavior. And then we just hit save and it will automatically evaluate the file and give us line numbers on the side. Uh, I don't actually like working with line numbers so I can just delete that and save again. Okay, so that's about user behaviors and using deltas to change the default behaviors and a little bit about how uh, Lighttable is represented as this one big value of uh, behaviors applied to different objects or contexts as I've been calling them. Um, I think that was pretty much all I wanted to cover so hopefully you've gotten a, a little bit of a taste and overview of, of what it's like uh, to configure and customize Lighttable and get started in the InstaRepl and uh, hopefully I've uh, piqued your interest for the project and uh, you'll at least download it and check it out if you haven't done so already. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed the screencast. Uh, thank you for watching for all this time and listening to me rant on about different things and I look forward to uh, speaking to you again in the future. Thank you very much and uh, take care. Cheers.